Well, we're into the next section in our journey through Revelation. We're looking at the big section, 12 verse 1 all the way to 15 verse 4. Um, I'll show you in a moment how this whole section holds together. But what we'll see in this section is that John is given a new perspective. He sees this great sign that appears in heaven. And so with this heavenly perspective, he is um, equipped to navigate life here on earth better. But as always, before you dig into the section along with me, I encourage you to read through the whole section. So pause the video, it's going to take you a while, but uh, read the whole section. Just familiarize yourself with um, the, the flow of John's vision that he sees, the sign that appears in heaven. Spend some time praying, ask God to open your eyes to see and understand wonderful truths in his word. And then as always, I'm going to highlights what I've seen in this passage. There's a chorus that comes uh, twice in this big section that really just helps us to hold the whole big section together. It's here in verse 10 of chapter 13. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And then we'll see it again in chapter 14. Verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. So you see there together in both these sections there is this call for patient endurance and faithfulness. That is the overarching theme um, of this entire section, endurance and faithfulness. I called this section the cosmic battle um, because as I said, we, John sees this great sign in heaven. Um, and just to help us with structure, there, there's a really uh, helpful repetition that we see throughout this section. That will just help us to, to break the big section up into seven smaller sections. So it starts here with a great sign. And another sign. So we're looking for um, signs. And a sign, obviously, if you're driving along, a sign is something you see. And that idea of seeing or looking is what helps us divide this whole section up into its smaller Pieces. So chapter 12 is our first big section and then we'll see this repetition, I saw or I looked, which is the key to help us divide the structure up. So 13 verse 1, I saw. And then 13 verse 11, I saw. 14 verse 1, I looked. 14 verse 6, I saw. 14 verse 14, I looked. And then 15, both 15 verse 1 and 2, I saw. Just a note up front, so 15 verse 1 acts as a transition verse. Um, it's going to transition us to look at the the plagues, the, the seven bowls of punishment that we'll see in the next big section. Um, so 15 verse 2 is the next little section that links in with the bigger section that we're looking at today. So let me just mark these out quickly. I'll work backwards through the passage. So we've got chapter 15, verse 1 to 4 as a section. 14, verse 14 to 20 as a section. Fourteen verse six to thirteen as a section. Fourteen verse one to five. 13, verse 11 to 18, 
13 verse 1 to, to 10. And then the whole of chapter 12. You can subdivide up a bit, but in the bigger structure, it's one unit. And all seven of these units are going to encourage us as God's people to endure faithfully. So let's see how that takes place. In this first section, let me just highlight the characters that we see. So we've got this woman. We'll talk a bit more about her in a moment. And who is this woman? Well, on first uh, glance, as you see her, she was pregnant, about to give birth. Some people jump to the conclusion, oh, this is Mary. But to better understand Revelation, we need a better understanding of the Old Testament. And if you've got a really good understanding of the Old Testament, as you hear about this woman in verse 1, she's clothed with the sun, the moon, and 12 stars. Now, in Genesis 37, we hear about Joseph and his brothers, and Joseph has a dream in which he and his brothers are 12 stars, and his parents are the sun and moon. And Joseph and his brothers became the 12 tribes of Israel, God's people. And so this woman is actually a picture of Israel. God's faithful people in the Old Testament. And then we see this great red dragon. So our two key characters, this woman representing Israel, the dragon we're told here in verse 9, that great serpent, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. And so right from Genesis 3 when sin entered the world and the serpent was told that a serpent crusher would come, someone who would crush his head, this serpent has been on the prowl waiting. And so that gives us another clue who is this child, this male child who's about to be born. Well, that is a picture of our Lord Jesus. And in this picture, not only, or in the greater big picture, not only is he called the male child, but he's also linked with uh, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And we'll see what it means to be part of those who are in the Lamb's Book of Life. A very key character in this bigger section, the male child who is born, um, who is the same picture as what we've seen in Revelation so far, the picture of the Lamb. It's a picture of Jesus. A couple of important things to see. So uh, this woman um, who is about to give birth to this child in verse 6. Yeah, she's there again. Um, she fled into the wilderness to a place prepared by God where she might be taken care of. Um, God's people are secure in this whole section. And this repetition we'll see here, uh, 1,260 days. It's the same as this repetition here for time, times, and half a time. And we'll also see here, 42 months. And again, we see that, that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of. So this idea of being taken care of out of the serpent's reach. Now, this 1,260 days, the time, times, and half a time, 42 months, they all are the same time frame. It's three and a half years 
which is 42 months uh, time and times and half a time. It's a year, two years, half a year, three and a half years, 1,260 days. It's three and a half years. And in Revelation, that is the picture of the church age. It's the same here. This is a picture of the days that we're living in right now, the days between Jesus' uh, first coming, when he ascended into heaven, and when he returns again. That is called the church age. In Re Revelation, it's symbolized by three and a half years, so half of uh, seven, so it's not the fullness of time. These are the days we're living in now. And what we see here is that in the church days, we are going to need to endure because life is going to be hard. And what we see in the rest of chapter 12 here, um, this dragon, he, he makes war. And we, we see it here. He, he realizes that um, he's in trouble. And so have a look. It says, the dragon and his angels fought back against Michael and his angels, but... He was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. So we see here that the battle was won. And this is a picture for us of what happened at the cross. The devil lost his place in heaven. The ultimate war was won. And we need to hold on to that. The war is won. But we get this big... We've got heaven rejoicing here because um, the, the lamb has triumphed over the dragon. Um, the battle is won. But then we see, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So uh, the dragon is now um, pursuing the woman who we've seen is a picture of uh, Israel. And bigger than that, the, the, the whole Israel. So the Old Testament and New Testament people of God. And the dragon is making war against her. He wants to make life hard for her. We see here the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to the testimony about Jesus. So what we're going to see in chapter 13 is, although the war is won, the battle continues. In chapter 13, we see two different beasts. So these two beasts become uh, the key characters in chapter 13. They are agents of the dragon. Uh, they are working on behalf of the dragon. And they are symbolic of the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people throughout the world and throughout history. I'm convinced that we aren't meant to look out for one specific beast that you can fit into this and a different specific person that you can fit into uh, the second beast. Um, I, I take that they represent, um, in the case of the first beast, he represents uh, human rulers, evil human rulers or governments. Um, throughout the ages, and throughout the world who stand opposed to God and his people. And why do I think that they represent uh, evil rulers? Well, we see that this beast who comes out of the sea has ten horns and ten crowns. Uh, horns in apocalyptic writing are a picture of power. And crowns are a picture of rule. So ten horns is a picture of he's very powerful. And ten crowns, um, it's a, 
a picture of rulership. But what we see here is that he's acting on behalf of the dragon. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and his authority. And many people worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast. They asked, who's like the beast? And so the picture here is of evil human rulers or governments acting on behalf of the devil, whether they know it or not, but leading many people astray. And um, the, this beast opens his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander the name in his dwelling place. And he's given power here in verse 7 to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. So this is showing us that life for those who live on the earth is going to get hard. And that's what we see. Um, although we're given a heavenly perspective, much of this um, picture here, because the dragon gets thrown down to the, to the earth, uh, much of this picture is representing what happens here on the earth. And we see here we're told that all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All, but not... It's a, it's a universal worship of the beast, but it's not a complete total worship of the beast because it says all will worship the beast all whose names have not been written in the lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world so only those who have been sealed whose names are in the lamb's book they won't worship the beast but for them life is going to get hard they'll go into captivity some will be killed with the sword and so there's this call to patiently endure and to be faithful to the end and then the second beast that we see is a picture of um, human uh, false religion. So we've got human, evil human rulers, but then we've got false religion. And we can see this because he looks like a lamb. So he's a, a parody of Jesus, but he speaks like a dragon. Um, so you see the dragon there. Um, but you see here that he's able to perform these great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven. So he's doing what uh, Elisha, Elijah did in 1 Kings with the um, prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal couldn't do this, but this beast can. So he is a picture of powerful um, false religion. And again, the second beast is given power. He's... Um, acting on behalf of the first beast and on behalf of the dragon. And he's making life hard. Now we see here also this uh, number 666. It's caused lots of people to um, debate. What these verses are saying, they're not saying that all people are going to get um, 666 tattooed on them or a chip under their skin this is an invisible mark of ownership. And the specific number 666, we told it's the number of man. Um, in Revelation 7 is the number of, uh, it's God's number. So 777 is God's number. And this is short of seven, short of seven, short of seven. It is an imitation, but not the real thing. It's the number of false religion and those who follow false religion. Our next scene then, uh, we see in chapter 14, we, we are give, given this beautiful picture of those who are with the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. It's the 144,000 again. So remember, we've seen this number before, um, 12 uh, times 12. So 12 Old Testament uh, tribes. 12 apostles representing the Old Testament and New Testament people of God. And then a thousand, a picture of a very big number. So it's not literally 144,000, uh, 144,000. It is um, the complete people of God standing with the Lamb. They have the Father's name on their foreheads. Um, so this is the redeemed people of God. Those who didn't defile themselves. 
These are those who have been purchased, redeemed by the Lamb. Um, so these are those who have endured. As I said, we're looking at this idea of endurance as the big theme of this section. And we've got beginning of chapter 14, uh, this picture of those who have been sealed. Then in chapter 15, from verse 2 onwards, we pick up that theme again. And we see these sealed ones singing, giving praise to the Lamb. They, they are the ones who have been victorious over the beast. And they're singing this glorious song of the redeemed. Because they are the saved one, saved ones. But then in between this picture and this picture, the rest of chapter 14 gives us a picture of judgment. Um, we... We hear these angel, this angel singing or crying out in midair, and this first picture here is—it's actually the call of the gospel. It's a call to fear God and give Him glory. But why? Because the hour of judgment has come. So again, it's a call to endure, but it's an, a call to us to endure because we don't want to be on the wrong side of God on the day of judgment. Here in verse 8, we fall in his Babylon. Babylon is a picture of um, society, world, a worldly city standing in opposition to God. And here we see that Babylon has fallen. And then this third angel cries out and says, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead, they will drink the wine of God's fury. It's a picture of torment that we see. For all those who worship the beast, um, they, they end up being tormented. And this picture that we're given here is horrific. Um, the harvest of the earth, where we see the, the wicked being pictured as if they are, are grapes that are ripe to be harvested. But it's not a pretty picture of a harvest. It is a horrific picture of harvest. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine. Gather the grapes and throw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia. It is a horrific picture that should churn our stomachs. The final judgment is a terrible thing. And in the, the middle of this picture of judgment we get this picture here this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his command and remain faithful and then I heard a voice from heaven says write this blessed are those who are, are the dead who died in the Lord from now on yes says the spirit they will rest so those who endure will end up being a part of the blessed ones they will be those who are at rest they won't face the torment of the judgment to come and they will end up being those who sing great and marvelous are your deeds lord god almighty so this whole big section is a call to endure why can we endure well quick work through the passage again we can endure because the wall is won jesus has won the wall and those who belong to him will win in the end that means that we can continue as this battle continues here on earth um, evil human rulers and powerful false religion we can endure against that because jesus has won and he has secured us for the future one day we will be standing on mount zion a part of this redeemed people of God singing praise to him. And so we are called to endure. Well, it's a big section. I pray that as you dig further into it, that it would encourage you to be a part of those who really do endure to the end. And as you teach it to others, may they see why it's worth enduring. It's worth enduring because Jesus has won. It's worth enduring because we don't want to be a part of those who are judged by God in the end. And it's worth enduring because the future that's been in, 
secured for us is glorious. So let's be a part of those who endure. Thank you.